sadness that all of us in Chennai felt because he had been such an inspiration to whole successive generations of progressive activists and communists and democrats. So I feel especially touched that I have an opportunity to pay my humble homage to a leader, a thinker, and a revolutionary without parallel who has inspired all of us for so long and continues to inspire us even today, although it's now 33 years since he passed away. A great sense of loss, because if he had lived longer, we know that he would have enlightened us so much more over the years. But that is now behind us. One tribute we can pay to him is to constantly recall his work, especially his focus on the agrarian question. And that is why even though the title of my talk is The Agrarian Crisis Today, I have tried to link the current agrarian crisis with the larger agrarian question that is so fundamental to the present stage of the revolutionary movement in India, the stage of People's Democratic Revolution. And therefore, in my talk, I will be proceeding in several steps. First, while the broad topic is the agrarian crisis that we are all familiar with now, I will first trace briefly the evolution of India's agrarian economy since independence up to the start of the 1990s, from 1991, when the neoliberal policies came to be implemented in a most accelerated fashion. There had been some liberalization earlier as well, but between 1950, when we became a republic, and 1991, when we embarked upon the, when the ruling classes embarked upon the program of LPG policies, we call them popularly, liberalization, privatization, globalization. That 40-year period was somewhat different in its trajectory for the agrarian and rural economy than what has happened after that. So that, that initially I will briefly uh, discuss the evolution of the economy and agrarian economy in 90, and then I will focus primarily on the period of neoliberal reforms and what they have implied, not just for the agrarian economy in a narrow sense, but for the agrarian population and more generally the entire rural population of our country. Second World War, both the international context and the national context put it on the table, the agenda of development in a very urgent way. Internationally, the advanced capitalist countries, the imperialist countries, especially of Europe, had been greatly weakened from the First World War onwards through the Russian Revolution, the Great Depression and the Second World War. And this provided for weakening of imperialism. This was further strengthened, this process was further strengthened by the advances of socialism, first in USSR and later in People's China and other countries. And these two developments, the emergence of a powerful socialist camp and the weakening of imperialism greatly accelerated the process of decolonization on a global scale, which meant that in the 50s, early 50s, there was an international environment that provided some space for large countries like India to embark on a relatively independent path of development, not wholly independent because they were still dependent on the Western countries for technology, for finance, for markets and so on. But to some extent, the newly obtained political independence, obtained after great struggle and with the help of progressive forces all over the world, did mean that we could embark on a relatively autonomous path of development. That is the first aspect of the situation. The second aspect was that domestically, the period preceding independence from mid 40s onwards, was also characterized by very powerful mass movements in the country. And uh, apart from the struggles of workers, the mutiny of the Royal Indian Navy and so on, the most important aspect of those mass struggles was the struggle of the peasantry. Of course, we are speaking in Andhra Pradesh. We are familiar with the glorious 
a Telangana armed struggle in which Kamal Sundaraya was a leader and key participant. But all over the country, not just in the Telangana region of uh, then Hyderabad state, but also all over the country, there were peasant uprising, whether it was the uh, Punapuravailar in Kerala or the Eastern Tanjavu region in Tamil Nadu or the uh, Varli tribals in Maharashtra or, of course, the struggles of the Bengali peasantry for uh, an increase in the share of tenants and so on. So there was a countrywide mood of popular unrest among the peasantry, raising very strong anti landlord demands, following the promises made in the freedom struggle by the national leadership. Freedom would mean land to the tiller and so on. So, in the context of the early 50s, not only was development possible, it was also urgent, and a central aspect of that development agenda would have to be comprehensive land reform. This was the atmosphere in the 50s. In that background, steps were taken, both because of pressures from below and also because of the need of industry to improve agricultural productivity in order to get supplies of raw materials, supplies of wage goods for the urban workers. Pressure was applied and some progress was made in some land reform legislation of various kinds. But more important, this is also the period when the state entered the development agenda in a big way and undertook investments, public investments in power, multi-purpose irrigation projects, rural infrastructure and so on, all of this meant that there was a push for agrarian modernization, not, not necessarily very egalitarian, but some kind of a, an improvement in productivity and so on. Because remember, that in the last five decades of colonial rule, from 1900 to 1950, food grain output in this country grew by hardly one half of one percent per year, well below the rate of growth of population. Country in 1947-50 had roughly about 150 kilograms per person per year as a food grain output, well below the requirements. And remember how unequally it was distributed. So mass hunger was a feature of society. And so on, one can go on, but very poor infrastructure. This was the context in which the first phase post-independence was a phase which saw both some limited land reforms and substantial public investments which enabled agricultural growth. And between 1950 and mid-60s, India's agricultural output grew at something like 3.5% per annum as compared to only 0.5% per annum before independence. While this happened primarily through expansion of area cultivated and some expansion of irrigation, not through new technology, from the mid-60s onwards, the coming in of the new technology in the form of the Green Revolution with a whole set of policy packages which involved very large support by the state for agriculture through subsidies for inputs, through procurement, through expansion of formal credit, through building up of a national agricultural research system, through strengthening of the extension system and so on, and of course linking the procurement system on food grains to a public distribution system so as to stabilize food grain prices across the country. This was an enormous uh, advance compared to what existed earlier and that therefore together these developments ensured that between 50 and more or less till the early 90s India's agriculture grew at over 3 percent per annum as compared to a historically low of half a percent. India's food grains output grew at about 3 percent per annum also higher actually with the rate of the weakening of the socialist in a very long time and the collapse of the socialist regimes increased in the agrarian of Eastern Europe and USSR society by the early 90s. Remember, we entered a unipolar world with US imperialism dominant. So our ruling classes were progressively abandoning the path of somewhat autonomous development that they had attempted earlier and were therefore falling in line with the hegemony of neoliberalism across the world and by 1991 in the context of a severe economic crisis India embarked upon accelerated neoliberal reforms which had three components that we are all familiar with. One is what we call liberalization or what I prefer to call deregulation meaning that the controls over the large private sector, domestic and foreign big capital, by the state would be removed. 
they had been there in the interest of social regulation and so on, but they would be removed and large Indian and foreign big capitalists would be free to operate in any manner they wished to make profits. This was the first aspect, what is called liberalization, what should be called deregulation, because this is not liberalization for the people. This is liberalization for big capital. In fact, in order that big capital is free to operate as it pleases, the government would then come and limit the liberties of working people against strikes, against unions and so on. So remember that liberty for the capitalist, as Ambedkar famously said, means absence of liberty for the working man. That is essentially the feature of the aspect of deregulation. Secondly, we talk about privatization. And of course, privatization in the sense of disinvestment of, let's say, the Hindustan uh, steel plant in Vizag or Salem or the Naval Elegant Corporation. We are familiar with the idea of disinvestment in public sector companies as privatization, but there's a much larger sense in which the neoliberal policies implemented privatization. This was that in many areas where the state had been considered the key agency, like education, health, infrastructure, in all these areas, neoliberal reforms said state will not play a role, at least not an important role, and these areas of health education and infrastructure will be handed over to the private sector which will then invest in these areas on the logic of profit maximization not on the logic of what is good for the people of India. This is the second important thing that is what privatization meant abandoning commitment to public goals, social goals in the areas of education or health or infrastructure or development and substituting in their place the logic of profit maximization by large private capital. The third aspect of uh, neoliberal reforms was what we call globalization, which also had two distinct aspects. One was to liberalize trade, imports and exports of goods and services would be made easier and foreigners would be allowed to dump goods into our country and so on and so forth. This is the area of trade, which is very serious because this meant that we were importing unemployment by importing goods from abroad instead of producing them here. But perhaps even more important, in 1991, for the first time, we allowed foreign capital as money to come into the country without any obligation to produce anything, but simply speculate in stock markets, in currency markets, in uh, you know, commodity markets. So this allowing foreign finance capital, capital as money coming in from abroad, to enter the country freely and to exit it freely without any any regulation of any serious kind and make profits without contributing productively to the economy. This was a fundamentally important part of the reform process in which began in the 1990s. And this particular reform, that is the allowing free movement of capitalist finance into and out of the country is the most serious aspect of the neoliberal reforms because this then meant that the government's economic policies would be all the time determined by fear about what foreign finance capital might do if the government takes an active role in the economy. Would they leave the country? Would they take the money out of the country? If they take the money out of the country, what will happen to the balance of payments? What will happen to the stock exchange? What will happen to the uh, value of the currency? So this fear of flight of foreign capital became the key feature of economic policies after 1991. And what they in turn meant was that since foreign capital does not like active government, since they do not like the government to incur large expenditures on welfare programs, what is now called derisively populist schemes, in the 15th Finance Commission for example, then the government of India would be constrained to restrict expenditure on pro-people schemes. You might ask, why can't the government you know, mobilize taxes from the rich and fund these schemes? But then, the moment you say that, the liberalizers would say, if the government tax the rich, then they wouldn't invest, there will be no jobs, the economy will collapse. So, since you cannot tax the rich very much for fear of losing, their losing incentive to invest, 
he was necessarily cut expenditure. So the obsession with reducing the fiscal deficit, at the term they often use, uh, became the mantra of policies from 1992 onwards. Now this fiscal deficit, I won't go into a long discourse on this, is quite simply total expenditure by the government minus all the money that comes to the government, which is not borrowed, the taxes, surpluses of enterprises, all this is okay. But government, if it borrows money, that doesn't count as a receipt. This is the tyranny of the fiscal deficit. Basically saying that private capital can borrow, but government cannot borrow. This is the fundamentally anti-people character of the whole regime. Now, this particular set of policies of deregulation or liberalization, privatization in the sense of abandonment of government responsibility for a whole range of uh, duties like education and health care and then the freedom for foreign capital to enter the country with money, make profits by speculation and exit the country without any obligation to produce anything. These were key elements and in particular the obsession with the fiscal deficit together with the understanding that taxation was not good. Taxation of the rich was not good. Taxation is not, you won't talk about taxation alone. GST is what? Taxation. But it is taxation of the poor. Indirect taxes on what you and I buy. But taxation of the rich was considered not, not desirable and therefore we entered a regime of decreasing share of government expenditure. What this particularly meant for agriculture was devastating because it meant that the enormous state support by way of the Green Revolution. I listed several things earlier. Credit, formal credit, procurement, research system, extension system, public distribution system, all these elements were now to be withdrawn. And agriculture was to be at the mercy of both the monsoon and the market. Leaving it at the tender mercies of international finance. In subsidies for imports. So this was the most important consequence. So, I will mean, summarize the these reductions in the food subsidy led to a sharp rise in the costs of production. Simultaneously, especially from the late 1990s onwards, under the WTO agreement, we liberalized imports further and we agreed to remove all restrictions on the quantity of imports of agricultural products from abroad. We had some duties, you know, import duties were there, but they were quite low compared to what we could have had. So the result was, from the late 90s onwards, there was also a massive flood of imports of agricultural produce from abroad. So this meant that domestic agricultural prices fell very sharply. So on the one hand, input costs were rising sharply. Simultaneously, output prices were falling sharply. So the Farmers were caught in a double squeeze. This was the immediate consequence through the 90s and the early 2000s of the neoliberal policies, worsened by a global deflation in the early part of the 21st century. But this is not the only implication. Second, financial liberalization, which began with the Nasimam Committee report in 1991, led to a sharp reduction in the access of the peasantry to credit from banks and other formal institutions and pushed a large section of the peasantry, primarily the poor and middle peasantry, not so much the landlord, they could still manage the banking system to some extent, but the poorer sections of the peasantry, the small and middle peasants, the poor peasants, they were forced to turn to money lenders and usurers to, to borrow money for cultivation purposes. So the sharp rise in interest rates and the decline in the amount of credit that one could get from the cooperatives and banks and so on. This is a very serious blow to agriculture of the peasantry as a whole. We'll come back to the distinction between peasantry on the one hand and landlords and big capital farmers later. But remember that whatever I'm talking about, the crisis, the negative implications of government policies were particularly severe for the peasantry as we understand it, for the small, poor and middle peasants and to some extent rich peasants also. So this was the second thing, financial liberalization led to a rise in interest rates, reduction in availability of credit. Third, government in order to reduce its expenditure 
cut back on rural development expenditure, cut back public investment in power, irrigation, rural roads, interior roads, infrastructure, storages, other facilities for farmers, power, you know, a whole series of cutbacks by government in terms of rural development expenditure meant that two things happened to the countryside. One, with the reduction in government expenditure, rural demand also fell, purchasing power fell because not much money was flowing into the countryside. Second, and more important, with the reduction in government expenditure on important infrastructure like roads and irrigation structures and so on, in the medium term, the supply side also got badly affected, productivity got badly affected, expansion of output got badly affected. Of course, productivity still did increase, and I'll come back to this point, it's very important, because to talk about agrarian distress, an agrarian crisis, does not mean that you assume that there is no growth. There is growth, some people are benefiting, but the bulk of the agrarian population is suffering. That's the point that we need to keep in mind. Don't uh, make the argument that nothing is happening in agriculture. A lot is happening. But the poor are victims of this process that is happening. So this is the third thing, that you had the cutback in public investment in infrastructure. Fourth, very important, with the commitment to reducing expenditure, the government started weakening the public distribution system. Since a large proportion of India's farmers do not survive only on their own grain production but need to buy in the market, this meant a direct attack on the living standards. Of course, it meant a much greater living uh, attack on the living standards of the landless and the laboring population. But the cutbacks in PDS, the weakening of PDS, from the early 90s, when as soon as Manmohan Singh became finance minister in Narasimha Rao's government, he jacked up fertilizer prices, he raised the issue prices of food grain by 90% in ration shops. This is the legacy of the neoliberal period. So suddenly one should not discover virtues in these people. Consistent neoliberal policies of both the Congress and the Sang Parivar is something we are experiencing, the great distress. So on these policies, they don't... They differ somewhat, but they don't differ radically. So it's important to keep this in mind. So these were immediate points of attack. Attack on input prices, a sharp fall in output prices, withdrawal of state support for infrastructural uh, expenditures, collapse of the PDS. All of this meant that the agrarian economy was being pushed into an extremely severe crisis. Mato. Prabhutu Karchu, Yosai made the Prabhutu Karcha did thank you for the Jerry and twenty Paranama Lu or Sayana and Paranama Jerry. What I want to emphasize first is to, and we are all familiar with this, but anyway, because Sainats and other people's wonderful work has vividly brought to us the massive agrarian rural distress caused by the neoliberal policies. Now, these are reflected in many indicators, but of course the most tragic indicator is that about 300,000 farmers have committed suicides between 1997 and 2017, over a 20-year period. This is something phenomenal in terms of its human tragedy implications. But of course, you know, our media do not seem to think it is important. There are other things more important for them. General dumping of consciousness. You see, what, what neoliberalism does is to destroy human values. It's to make all of us indifferent to the suffering of the fellow human beings. And this is, this is where, you know, I, I, I recall Marx. What did Marx say as a young man of 17? He said, uh, you know, people who think they're very practical tell me to be wise and to be practical. But he says, look, one can be an ox and turn one's back on human suffering. What is the implication? Marx was saying, I don't want to be an ox, I want to be a human being. I want to share people's suffering and try and improve it. Now, essentially, this massive distress that is all around us uh, is not impacting on our conscience sufficiently, I think. We are, we are accepting it as part of the... The peasantry are now reminding us that they will no longer accept it. That is the meaning of the Maharashtra Long March. That is the meaning of the Rajasthan struggle. That is the meaning of struggles all over the country. But this is one aspect. Massive distress, rising costs, falling prices, no support from government, no credit, rising tenancy. That's a new feature of this period, rising tenancy. And you were 
familiar in coastal Andhra, what is happening in tenancy, you know, what, what in rental rates, you know, I won't give you statistics, you know enough about it. But, so this is one aspect. When we talk about the agrarian distress in this manner, we recognize the enormous human suffering involved. But we must not make the mistake of thinking that this period of massive rural agrarian distress was also one where agriculture completely stagnated or declined. It did not. That's a point that is difficult to accept, but that's one must recognize that even through this period from 1991 to 2018, agriculture continued to grow in terms of output. Output tot in total output also grew, output per unit of land also grew, Profits made by a section of the agrarian population also increased. So, this crisis or distress, widespread distress, the, dis the distress was completely widespread across the entire period. But the nature of the agrarian regime was not the same through the entire 26, 27 years. There were periods of relatively less of an impact of these policies in the early phase, 91 to 97. There was a particularly severe period from 97 to 2004, which also happened to coincide with the NDA in office, although that is not the only reason for it, NDA, the first NDA. Then from 2004 to 2008, when the UPA-1 government was dependent on the support of the left parties from outside, it was possible to get some revival of public investment in agriculture, possible to get some pro-people measures implemented. We had the MNRGA passed, we had the Tribal Forest Rights Act passed, so there was some relief with increased public investment, improved credit, and some pro-people measures of this kind for a brief period. But that was only for a few years. And then subsequently again, the tendency for government policies to brutally attack the working population of the country said has continued. So the distress aspect is one, it is very severe, but it is differentiated both by period and by region and of course also by crops. This is one part. So one must recognize that the crisis was not undifferentiated, but nonetheless we can established from official data that the rates of growth of output as well as productivity declined very sharply. It stayed positive, meaning output grew and productivity grew, but much more slowly in the period from 1990 to 2016. I've done the calculations and is that in the paper. Much more slowly in this period than it had done in the earlier 81 to 91, the, the, the last the best decade of the Green Revolution saw so much more rapid rates of growth of agriculture, output and yield. But from 91 to 2016, with some changes in between, you know, varying across this period, the rates of growth of output and productivity have been much lower. So that is clearly a very negative impact of neoliberal policies in agriculture, no doubt about it. It is characterized by widespread distress, no doubt about it, but the deformation does not occur. It's all only not everybody, you know, uh, accumulation by disposition and so on. Now, that is not a correct understanding. Accumulation by disposition may also occur, no doubt about it. But real accumulation is also occurring. And, and why do I say that? I am saying that there is a section of the agrarian population which even through this period of distress has been able to appropriate surplus. And that surplus has been converted into capital equipment, mechanization, purchase of more land, improved ownership of land, better irrigation, more modern facilities for irrigation for every operation in the countryside, for every crop, shift to more technically sophisticated methods of production, more remunerative crops of a certain kind, look for the export market, fly your flowers to the Mumbai airport. That is a section of the agrarian population consisting of capitalist landlords and big capitalist farmers who have been able to appropriate surpluses even through this period of distress 
And they have expanded their assets and I have given some numbers. I am not going to go into numbers in this talk. That you can read on your own. There has been a substantial increase in the use of farm machinery. It has to come from somewhere. Money has to come to buy it from somewhere. So there has been a substantial increase in inequality of assets among the different sections of the Indian population. Whether you look at land concentration or concentration of ownership of productive assets, there has been a substantial increase in inequality. In other words, differentiation has continued. It has not ceased. There has been further differentiation. And what is happening to the poorer and the middle peasantry or being put to the margins. A section of the rich peasantry is also badly affected, but there is a small section of the old traditional landlords who have all now become, practically all of them have become capitalist landlords. There is relatively very little of the old feudal landlord left for most of India. Because it's difficult to generalize for India always. Each state is different. But in a general sense, you can say that today the dominant form of landlordism is capitalist landlordism, not the old kind of feudal landlordism. Plus, some section who are traditionally not big landowners, but have used government policies after independence very skillfully to acquire more land and more assets. And now they, while they were earlier participating in the manual operations of agriculture and, and commerce in the are very particular in classifying peasantry. They must participate in the major manual operations, he would say. These characters were earlier like that have now become part of the ruling class in the countryside. The big capitalist farmers have emerged in the last 20 years or so under reforms using earlier state support and subsequent state support. They still receive support. As Comrade Madhu was saying earlier when he spoke in Telugu, I could follow a little bit subsidies for missionaries, this, that, it is there. They are getting it. Presently, are not getting it, but they are getting it. So there is a section which is benefited. And I want, I've given some figures here. So the point I'm making is that, yes, there has been some accumulation in the countryside which has occurred through the appropriation of surplus value from the workers in the countryside who work on these estates and farms. The peasantry has been badly affected, but a section, the capitalist form, big capitalist farmers and landlords have in fact benefited. And don't forget that they today in the countryside, these big capitalist landlords and uh, farmers and capitalist landlords are not engaged only in agriculture. They run schools, hospitals, they run the cinema theatres, they run the mills, they have the people in local panchayats, they run the credit societies, they control the property societies, the children work in important departments of the government in Hyderabad and Vijayawada. And of course some of them live abroad and send money to buy more land. You know that phenomenon in Andhra very well. So this, this enormous concentration of power in the countryside is something we should not lose sight of in the general talk of the agrarian and rural crisis. There is an accumulation of capital going on. Contrary to people who argue that the dominance of finance capital means no accumulation. I don't agree with that. Accumulation can occur. In the, of course, there is corporate land mafia. There is uh, all kinds of deals going on. There is this government land acquisition policies which are horrendously anti present and pro-corporate. Of course, sitting here very near Amaravati, I need to explain this to you. But nonetheless, nonetheless, in the midst of all this, we must recognize that there has been capitalist development in the countryside, been further differentiation. And this is when I will turn to the agrarian question. But before I do that, let me also note that the reform spirit has been characterized by a much larger and increased role for foreign capital in Indian agriculture, much more than ever before, in the form of seed, in the form of technology, in various other forms, in the form of contracts of various kinds. And they have received support from the state. The state has supported corporatization of agriculture and has not hesitated to invite both foreign capital and domestic big capital in this process. And this is a very important aspect for the future that we need to be aware of, that this is a danger also that is there that the dependent peasantry is facing. So an overall assessment central government and many state governments, hand in hand with corporatization, have also reverse land ceilings. They allow corporate land grab, they lease out land at practically zero rents to these big corporate entities, and they raise 
you know, ceiling limits everywhere, reversing the earlier land reform legislation. So all these attacks are happening. These attacks are attacks on the peasantry, not the agricultural labor population. But in the meanwhile, a small section of the agrarian population is getting enriched as well. Minutes, including translation, maximum 20 minutes. So I'll finish by 8.30. But some things have to be said. So this brings me then to what is not just agrarian distress, but what we call the agrarian crisis and linked to that is the agrarian question. The point I want to make is the following, that while agrarian distress has been widespread, throughout this period. This has also meant a crisis for the majority of the peasantry. Crisis in what sense? That they are unable to reproduce their farms, both through crop agriculture and through livestock and animal husbandry operations, dairy and all that. They are unable to make ends meet. So in most peasant households, they need multiple sources of income just to survive. They must not only work on the farms, must not only tend to their cattle, they must also go out and work as wage labor elsewhere. They must also try and get some non-form employment. They must put somebody in other service sector employment if they can. They may migrate if necessary. So today a peasant household is unable to reproduce its farm or its household without multiple sources of non-agricultural income as well. And so this is the meaning when I say that they are unable to reproduce their capital. This is true for a vast part of the peasantry, not for everybody, as I said earlier. Now, this agrarian crisis is very much linked to the agrarian question. So what is the agrarian question that we have in India? In India, we have a basic contradiction. After all this talk about liberalization and all the TV and uh, WhatsApp and all this, we've forgotten all this, you see. There is actually in the countryside, although the extent of this varies across different parts of the country, there is a basic contradiction in India's countryside between landlordism on the one hand and the mass of the peasantry and agricultural and rural laborers on the other. This has not disappeared. If you look at any data on land holdings or rural asset holdings, they only concentrated has increased. There may be a change in the social composition of land ownership. The erstwhile upper caste agricultural classes may have moved to other occupations in some parts of the country, not everywhere, in some parts of the country. But nowhere has there been a great reduction in the inequality of ownership of land and other productive assets. So that divide has actually increased and with the with those very powerfully placed in terms of ownership of assets, they are also able to get other sources of income, like I said earlier, contractors and so many other forms of income. Whereas for the mass of the peasantry, the withdrawal of state support under neoliberalism has meant the collapse of their forms, their inability to reproduce themselves. And they are therefore in a much more severe crisis. For them, the term agrarian crisis is very appropriate. This is one. Second, apart from this extreme concentration of ownership of land and productive assets, in the surveys that the Foundation of Agrarian Studies has been doing, which I am also associated, and in my own surveys in Tamil Nadu and elsewhere, what we find is that there is continued political and social power of the landed gentry in the countryside. It does not disappear. The powerful landed gentry in the countryside, whether they may be more sophisticated now, they may wear better clothes, they may speak a foreign language, but they are still landed gentry of the countryside and their power, the, the support they provide to institutions of caste oppression, for example, the support they provide to patriarchy and anti-woman attitudes in the countryside, for example, the, the value system that they perpetuate in the countryside. This whole power of the landlords and big capitalist farmers vis-a-vis -vis perpetuating the caste system for their own purposes the point that Kamala Tagore makes in one of these uh, articles in the Marx is where he makes the point that you know the caste system has a functional purpose for these people. They use it to divide working people. So this use of caste, use of patriarchy, these are important issues. And, and so if you do not understand that every government scheme, which may be of some little benefit to the poor, gets mediated through these these people, comes through them. They are the 
distributors and patrons of power in the countryside. Don't ever forget that. Just don't look only at uh, the smaller size of holdings of the landlords compared to earlier period. That's one aspect, but that's not the only aspect. So it's important that oppression against Dalits, Adivasis and women, which continue in the countryside as an important feature in many parts of the country, including our two states, Andhra and Tamil Nadu, where we are, the left parties are both fighting a big battle there. This is also a reflection of the continued power of the landlord section in the countryside. So that's important to remember this. So finally, from, arising from this, we do say, and we need to keep this understanding in my view, that landlordism continues to be an obstacle to the growth of productive forces and democracy in the countryside. But of course we know, we do know, one thing we do know, which is that compared to the immediate situation after independence, when the Indian big bushes is very dependent on landlords, today within the ruling coalition, big business probably has more power. So the balance of power within the ruling coalition with big, between big business and the rural land and gentry and big capital farmers has probably changed and will keep changing. But in the countryside, they are still the masters. They are the masters of the countryside and they won't let you forget it if you try to tell them anything different. So the again question then ultimately then, what is the great question? So it is basically a question of identifying who the friends of the people are and who the enemies of the people are. What holds back the advance of democracy and you know education for all, health for all, decent living standards for all, equality, the notion of equality, modern democratic equality, what holds it back? This holds it back. Landlordism holds it back. And therefore the question of the agrarian question is one of how do we overcome this landlordism as an obstacle to the advance of democracy in the countryside. And as this was a question that comes from the has read all his life. Who were the friends, who were the enemies? It's a read with utmost seriousness, both theoretically and through concrete studies of present differentiation and capital development in the countryside throughout his political life. I think it's important today to remember that. And to me, that is the most central inheritance we have from Comrade Sundaraya, that the study, the concrete situation, don't only stay with generalities. So, understood as not just an economic category, but as a social and political category. And embracing within itself both landlords and big capitalist farmers, we can say landlordism is the most important enemy of the working people in the countryside. No doubt that the leader in the class alliance, the big bourgeoisie, and imperialism will also come into the frame. But do not miss the landlord in front of you. Just because he speaks a different language today. Just because he has got a mobile phone and talks WhatsApp and all that. The landlord is still a landlord. And the power of that landed gently is not a crisis. This has come in many forms. They have cut back allocations for the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee schemes. They have moderated increase in procurement prices. They have kept fuel prices high, even when internationally crude oil prices fell very sharply. And now in the coming period, these oil prices will increase very sharply and we'll have to tax the presently with this. They have introduced demonetization, which has badly affected the agrarian economy. They have brought in the GST, which is a further burden on the working people of the countryside. So the policies, these ultra neoliberal policies, of opening up every sector of the economy to foreign direct investment and to big capital uh, that, the MD, that the present BJP regime pursues is certainly not going to help resolve the agrarian crisis, it will make it worse. That apart, of course, we know that they also have a, a strong agenda of communalism to divide working people. That is something we have been all fighting. Uh, so, under these circumstances, in a countryside where, what do we observe? We observe a severe crisis of the mass of the peasantry. We observe a very large increase in the number of manual workers in the countryside. The population of the countryside that survives by doing manual work has increased in village after village. We also find that the amount of hired labor that we find in the countryside for agriculture, a very large part of it is contributed by not just landless agricultural labor families, but also poor peasant families. So today the real struggling, exploited population in the countryside or the 
landless laborers, both in agriculture and outside of it, pure agricultural wage labor no longer exists. They all work in multiple tasks, purely active labor force. This landless labor force and the poor peasantry, these are the sections that are facing the brunt of the agrarian crisis, the rural economy crisis of today. So what, the only why this mobilization of this section, because remember we have not only an agrarian crisis, but a jobs crisis. There has been no employment created in the last four, four years, C compared to all the promises made about two crores of jobs a year, there been hardly any increase in employment. And if you ask the Prime Minister, he says, look at the fellow who makes pakodas. So this is the approach to the whole issue. So today, the very severe employment crisis in the countryside, very severe agrarian crisis, and so our task therefore then becomes uh, one of widest mobilization of the peasantry and the agricultural workers in the countryside, poor peasants and manual labor, this is required to change policies, otherwise policies won't change. And without changing these policies, you cannot save the peasantry or the agricultural workers. So the surge of peasant struggles over the last two years, a whole swath of states, starting from Rajasthan, going through Maharashtra, then Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, so the entire uh, northern belt of the country gives us hope. There have been big mobilizations in southern states also. This gives us hope that it is possible to mobilize the peasantry. Of course, currently they may be mobilized under just two demands, remunerative prices and waiver of loans. But that will not be the only thing. There are other issues to be brought to the forefront and our struggle against social oppression is an important strand here. So we need to bring together the poor peasants and agricultural laborers and under the leadership of the working class, this is very important because to integrate the whole process, this is the focus that we need to do. But while this is a general proposition, I think the most important lesson I take away from Comrade Sundaraya's life and in the terms of the present context is that pursuing concrete studies of class differentiation in the countryside, which is changing significantly, because today's countryside is not the old countryside, very much linked to urban areas, to international economy, there are non-agricultural activity there. So pursuing concrete st studies of class differentiation in the countryside which is changing significantly with the increased presence of non-agricultural activities and closer ties with the larger urban industrial economy. This will be an important part of the task in popular mobilization. You can't simply mobilize blindly, you have to mobilize it on the basis of analysis and concrete analysis of different parts of the country is what is needed today, what, where we are actually lacking on the left. We need many more of those studies. If we can do that, if we can carry out the studies, this is one way of paying our tribute to Comrade Sundaraya, the pioneer of the analysis of present differentiation in the Indian Communist Movement. With this, I close my address and I pay once again my homage to the great Comrade P. Sundaraya.